We'd now like to introduce our um, speaker for the evening. Many of you are familiar with Jen Shields. Her topic tonight is clinical conversations, working with parts and ego state therapy, practical tools to boost your mental health in the winter. Jennifer Shields is an Ontario-based therapist who supports clients with mastering emotional regulation processing past trauma and improving relationships. Jennifer's approach applies principles from ego state therapy, hypnosis, yoga, and eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy to support clients to meet their therapeutic goals. Jennifer is passionate about sharing practical tools to boost mental health through corporate organizational wellness workshops. She is an enthusiastic alumni of the Factor in Wintage Faculty of Social Work at the University of Toronto. Thank you, Jen. Over to you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you for that summary. I'm going to call you Dean Voisin uh, because we can still do that for the next week. So I'm just so grateful to be here this evening uh, sharing uh, something that's very near and dear to me and hopefully uh, very useful to you as we go into the winter months. So I've prepared a PowerPoint slide. I will share the screen with you and we'll get started. Okay. Give me one sec to set this up. Slideshow. Okay. So <clears throat> we'll start with just a few pieces, housekeeping introductions outline. We'll go through those pretty quickly. Um, so the first piece is just around housekeeping. So I've made the slides available to all those who are joining us this evening and they can be sent out after the presentation. Uh, camera, please feel free to turn your camera on to say hello or wave hello, understanding that it is, you know, dinner time. If you're, you know, eating something, if you're on the go, don't feel compelled. You can weave in and out as you wish. Um, sometimes it's useful to have the camera on. So if I'm explaining something and you're looking at me quizzically, I know to reframe or to give more information. Um, participation though is welcome and there are lots of ways to participate. Uh, you know, people are popping into the chat, so you're welcome to uh, type in the chat if you have anything you want to share. You can also give me a reaction if anything that I'm sharing is, you know, particularly useful. You can give me a thumbs up or, you know, whatever it is that's uh, meaningful. Microphone, we're going to keep your mics off just because of the amount of people and the session is recorded. Um, the members, though, that are attending will be kept anonymous, so you will not be in the recording. This is for the information to get out to those who couldn't join today. Okay. Uh, again, thank you to the Factor Inwintosh Faculty of Social Work for having me. My time at the faculty was uh, one of the best of my life. Um, and uh, I'm just so grateful again, so thank you. So who am I? I'm a clinical social worker based out of Toronto, so I am in private practice. Um, I, pro I provide remote-based therapy to adults and adolescents across Ontario, um, and I do corporate and organizational mental health workshops because of the need for it right now, and I love to share what I've learned. Um, I am a certified EMDR therapist and a consultant in training, um, and that is through uh, EMDRA, the International Association. Um, I've done parts of the professional training program with ISSTD, so I'm a member of ISSTD, which is an amazing professional association if you're a therapist uh, and interested in trauma to become a part of. And then here are my inspirations. Um, I've trained in ego state therapy, uh, EMDR, hypnosis. I love to learn. So this is a synthesization of all that I've learned that I've found helpful that I hope you will find helpful too. Who are you? This webinar is open to all University of Toronto graduates. So I'm so interested to hear if you graduated from U of T, you can pop in the chat and let me know what faculty or what major, what year, um, you know, where are you joining from? Uh, we've had so many international participants and I just think it's pretty cool if you're joining from far away to let me know. 
And if there are any social work alumni on the call, which I know that there are because I see them um, from my year specifically, thank you so much for joining and it's so lovely to connect. Agenda for today. We're gonna be going over a lot of clinical theory. So this will be quite information heavy. If you're a therapist, you can use this with your clients. And if you are um, a lay person, this I hope will be helpful to you to integrate in your own life. Then we'll apply the theory to practical applications of how ego state therapy can be used, um, especially around the holidays and winter, as this is a stressful and sometimes, you know, depressing time of year. And then we'll go through some experiential exercises so you can not only learn here, but you can learn here as well. Have a felt sense of integrating the knowledge. Okay, pause, breathe, resume. This is a reminder to me to go not so fast, but we're going to move on. Okay, so the first piece is um, so clinical theory. So a note on the resources, I referenced as best as I could. If there's something I say in this session that you'd like to know more about, um, send me an email. My email's on the slides and I'll also put it in the chat. Um, please feel free to reach out and I can direct you to where I got that information from. Okay, so we're starting right off with uh, what are ego states? So ego state is exactly what we are here for to learn about today. So <clears throat> ego state therapy is a psychodynamic approach in which techniques of group and family therapy are employed to resolve conflicts between the various ego states um, that constitute a family of self within a single individual. So um, I added in a visual here of a boardroom with different seats. So basically ego state therapy maintains that in, within one person, we can use family therapy techniques to resolve uh, conflicts or uh, lessen mental health symptoms. And ego state therapy was developed by the Watkins. So John and Helen Watkins, um, and they initially uh, share their findings in the Journal of Clinical Hypnosis. Okay. So we're going to use the terms ego states and parts of self interchangeably. Uh, so you might have heard of parts therapy before, right? Um, for those of you that have read uh, Bessel van der Kolk's uh, seminal book, uh, The Body Keeps the Score, he actually has a whole chapter on why it's so important to get familiar with the fact that people have parts, especially when there's been a trauma history. So ego state therapy is one of the many ways that we work with parts, um, knowing that some of you on the call might be trained in internal family systems. Um, I am not trained in internal family systems. I've had some training, uh, but I'm curious to hear from you. If you have any feedback, you can get in touch and let me know what you think. Um, how are they similar? How are they different? So um, in ego state therapy, we recognize that personality is not simply one collection of perceptions, cognitions, and affect. These are organized into clusters or patterns, which are called ego states. So if you have a look at the pictures here, you'll see I have a picture of a sunflower. So we would say, although we have one flower, that flower has many petals. It's still one flower, but it has a collection of distinct parts. Same goes with a tree. You have one tree that has many branches. The one that I use with my clients the most often is although you have one hand, your hand has not many, but some fingers, right? So not just one. And that these work together to constitute the whole. And again, the metaphor of the rainbow. One rainbow, many colors. So why do we understand that parts of personality are clustered into different parts? And that is because of the way that we study and understand memory. So what are memories? When we think of memories, we might think of images we see. I remember what the holidays were like when I was a kid, or you might see pictures of yourself and say, oh yeah, I remember that. But memories are also emotions, sensations, and five sense perceptions. It's what we see, hear, feel, taste, and smell. So we actually take snapshots of our, our, of our environment with all the planes of processing, cognitive, emotional, somatic, and five sense perception, 
So that when we experience a thought, emotion, sensation, or when we have any sensory experience, it lights up the part of our brains where we have stored associations. So in this slide, I've added some photos that will have different associations for you and I. At the top left, you'll notice those are muffins. The minute I see muffins, I think banana muffins. What other kinds are there? And it's almost as if I can smell them. I associate them with comfort. If you know, you're on the line and we're friends or colleagues, you'll know that I give banana muffins out. I, I um, relate them or associate them to comfort and closeness and community. You may have a different association. Driving. When I get into my car, I feel free. I, I don't know off the top of my head, though, how do I drive? It's only when I get into my car do I know, okay, what has to go first? I don't think before I do something in the same way you don't think every time you take a step. I put a picture here of a dance studio, perhaps. It makes me think of a yoga studio, and I have lots of associations with that. I added a picture of a green soup that to me looks like pickle soup which is the soup of my childhood. So if you gave me that right now, I would take me back sensorially to a very comforting uh, place and a very specific place, okay? So what are the goals of uh, ego state therapy? Our goal is to become aware of the parts of self and the patterns of our personality. We want to improve the internal communication between the different parts of self. We're looking to improve the way that parts communicate with one another in a collaborative, non-judgmental, and, and respectful way. In our use of language, we highlight that an internally fraught system can lead to mental health challenges. So think about the language we use. I'm coming undone. I'm falling apart. Um, I'm torn up, right? So we can consider that positive mental health happens when all the parts of us work together um, to collaborate towards our well-being. Here is a graphic that I made and I'm very proud of here. So you can consider that we can think of there are many parts of us that relate to a situation. For example, can somebody maybe in the chat box give me a situation that many people might have mixed feelings about? And this doesn't have to be self-disclosive, but it can be, you know, something that people, um, and if it's, difficult to do, I'm happy to offer a few. So while I wait for that, what we do is you can consider the situation to examine is like a projector screen. And we project something onto that screen that we wish to look at. Then we consider that the triangles are seats at the theater. So what I might do in a therapy session is I mean, yeah, oh, okay, somebody put something perfect, going on a date. Let's just use that one because that one's you know really useful. So something we might, oh, riding a roller coaster. These are awesome. So I'm going to use going on a date because I can just feel how fraud it can be for the first time to meet somebody. So a part of you going on that date might feel giddy, right? I don't know why I feel giddy thinking about that. It's like, and you can see my shoulder making this movement. I've tapped into an ego state of what it's like to go on a date. Another part of me might be nervous. I don't know how this person's going to receive me. Another part of me might be, you know, taken back to all the times in my life where I've gone on bad dates or good dates and it didn't end up working out. Um, another great example is a breakup. So when I work with adolescents, you know, they're very distraught when they're broken up with and we can put the situation to examine. And we often get to the point that, you know, there's a part of me that like didn't even really like this person or didn't think it would be a good fit. But there's another part of me that's devastated. And the whole point is to spend some time with the different parts of self and how you relate, because many people don't even know that it's okay to have opposing viewpoints about one situation. We can think of that black and white thinking, well, do you like this person or do you not? But it's much more complicated than that. Than that. And I just put popcorn to show that it's a theater. And uh, yeah, you, you're welcome to use this. This is adapted from Jim Knight's book, um, Great. Okay. Parts of self. So this is probably the most involved um, slide that we're going to be talking about. So 
Uh, please feel free to pop into the chat if you have any questions about what we're talking about here or if any of this you know, needs further clarification. So when we are talking about the parts of self, we want to be concerned with what are we going to call this part of self? Um, so think about the power that a name can hold. I'll give you an example. I have a perfectionist part. I have a silly part. I have a professional part. I have a dancing part. And we can even think of the name of the um, impact that a word or a phrase can have on our lives. You know, you can think of um, a name of somebody that you've known historically. And now anytime you think of that name, it takes you back. So it's really uh, therapeutic to name the parts of self that we're working with. Every part has a function. So we consider what is this part trying to accomplish? Ego state therapy is really neat because it considers that we are all trying to move towards our health and well being. For those of you that practice EMDR, which is a type of therapy, uh, this is a foundation of the therapy that our bodies, our minds, our hearts want to move us towards well being. But sometimes we're doing that in a way that is no longer relevant on December 13th, 2021, and it was historically. So ego state therapy would ask, you know, what is this, what is this symptom trying to find a solution to? And I'll give you an example. Uh, so for some people who struggle with substance substances, we can say, you know, what is the function of that? Hmm. Is it that you're trying to regulate your emotions or are you using substances as a way to connect with others? Isn't that interesting? Um, there might be a part of you that has nightmares and we can consider, okay, well, what's the function? Is it perhaps that you're trying to make sense of a situation while you sleep? Your brain is just working overtime trying to solve this or make meaning of a problem. Um, there might be a part of you that, you know, gets in fights with your partner. What is the function of that? You know, for some people, they're afraid of intimacy. So fighting is easier, but ego state is really unique in that we look at a function of a symptom, uh, which also reduces shame, right? Ego state therapy looks at resources and strengths. A foundational part of ego state therapy is that you, clients, actually have the ability to help yourself with problems. And a lot of social work theories pay lip service to this, but ego state therapy really operationalizes it. So we might ask, um, is there, okay, you told me you're struggling with this problem. Is there any part of you that can help you with this, right? And most of the time people can conjure up something or we might consider um, people often have their own solutions. And if we just give them a moment to search for them or call on their inner wisdom, those solutions do tend to come out. Ego state therapy also believes that there are transferable skills that can be applied from one situation to another. So I might ask you, what do you need to make it through the holidays? Do you need calm? Okay. Can you tap into that ego state where you feel calm? Yeah. When I feel calm, I picture myself reading. Okay. Wonderful. Paint a picture for me. And we get the client to think of really bring that ego state online. And then we say, now think of the holidays and can you apply some of that? Okay. Age and ability. Some ego states can feel younger or some can feel older. If you've ever had the experience of being with a family member and suddenly I'm an angry teenager, how did that happen? Or I feel in a work situation, my boss you know, is making uh, remarks that make me feel like a helpless child. So we've all had this experience before, perhaps, maybe not, of feeling like, well, what age does this feel like? Something that triggers this ego state to come online. So this is very important. So ego states come online when they're poked at, when they're triggered. So you get this experience when you see a specific person. If I see some people in this workshop that feel, you know, really supportive to me, I might see them and an area lights up in my brain where, ha, huh, I feel so supported and connected. Alternatively, I might see someone that makes me feel scared or nervous. That's the trigger. If you've ever had the experience of hearing a song that makes you feel really happy or really sad, um, for me, it's, you know, in the sound of music, that song Edelweiss, 
for some reason, anytime I hear it, it just makes me tear up. It's so beautiful and reminds me of my childhood and that movie I've watched so many times. The time of year. So winter can trigger ego states of lethargy and tired. And remember that uh, triggers can be a thought, emotion, sensation, or anything from our five sense perception. A formation story. So how did this part come to be? All the parts of us develop in a context, both cultural and specific. And later on, we'll talk about um, how ego states develop, which is fascinating research. Um, and again, that reduces shame. You don't have to be ashamed that a part of you is like this or experiences this. I'm sure there's a very good reason. And we're going to explore that together. Language and tone. Ego states have their own language. So think about how you present professionally than you do when you're playing. I know certainly when I'm playing with my dog, it's like something comes over me and my pitch goes all the way up. And we think of nicknames like Gooby Goo. Like, I don't even know where one comes up with something like that, uh, but it's certainly a different ego state within me. Physical sensations, uh, emotions, um, Time, so that's, you know, self-evident time orientation. This is really interesting that if we have a traumatic experience, there might actually be parts of us that come online when they're triggered and they are not time oriented. They don't know what time, what day it is or that it's 2021 and that the trauma is over. Similarly, um, awareness or amnesia. So some parts hold specific knowledge um, that other parts don't know about. And if this is new information to you, the first time I learned this, it was just mind blowing when I learned about dissociative identity disorder. So in dissociative identity disorder, there's an actual part of a person that has amnesia, doesn't remember something from the past, or doesn't know that another part of them uh, becomes executive and does things. And then this part comes too. There's even research in dissociative identity disorder that shows that some parts can have different abilities, like some parts can speak a language while a different language while another part can't speak. Um, and there's even some fascinating research that shows that um, some different parts might have different physiological markers, like different um, eyeglass prescriptions. Way beyond the scope of our talk today. Fascinating nonetheless. Couldn't help myself. Had to put it in. Do we have any questions about that? Um, is this new information to you? Um, you know, do you have any question about the parts of self? I'm really curious to know. And a reminder to pause and breathe before we resume. I get very passionate about this information. So if I'm going too fast, please tell me. Okay, somebody asked a question. Does this relate to family systems therapy? Yeah. Um, so family systems therapy is just another way of conceptualizing parts of self. Family systems therapy uh, uses more prescriptive language. We all have this like manager within us, um, or we all have parts of us that we exile that we don't want to deal with. So family systems therapy gives us um, some inspiration for the parts, whereas ego state um, is a little bit more explorative. Um, but they do certainly have similarities, but I'm not trained in family systems. Olivia says, is there an average number of parts an individual has? Nope. Everyone is different. And you might consider in your own life, how many parts of you do you have? Yeah. Somebody said resonate with a summer versus winter ego state. Abs we get the feeling of like coming alive in the summertime. And that's a physiological experience, um, um, an emotional, a somatic, a cognitive. Thank you so much for your thoughtful questions. So ego states and parts of us are not typically in our conscious awareness. So I added in a, a Freud quote here. The mind is like an iceberg. It floats with one seventh of its bulk above water. Okay. So you might, you know, without awareness, simply have an ego state that's triggered. And you think then, oh, this is who I am now. I'm just an angry teenager or um, I'm going to be depressed all the time. Oh, yeah, it's winter. I'm depressed. This is the rest of my life, right? But we can consider that uh, we can recruit other ego states to help us. And um, we'll get to that a little later in our talk. 
there's a body connection in ego state therapy. So I'm not sure how many of you attended my previous um, talks with um, the faculty of social work. I'm so passionate about a body connection in therapy. Um, I find cognitive behavioral therapy useful, but I just don't see how we can work without tapping into how the body experiences things. So physiological voices need to be a component of therapy. Somatic symptoms can be a window into the unconscious. So I'm shocked and surprised that, you know, if I've ever asked my clients, is there a part of you that knows something about the headaches or stomach aches or pain you're experiencing, right? Um, this isn't to say that, you know, all pain necessarily has something to tell us, but a lot of the times it can. Um, and then I added in this quote, until you make the subconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. Fascinating. How do ego states develop? So in my training, I've learned there are three ways that ego states develop. The first is through normal, differenti normal differentiation. That means we simply just exist in different contexts and we develop clusters of ways that we think, feel, and act in those uh, contexts. The second is through an interject. So which is internalizing what is said to us externally during core developmental times, but also throughout the course of our lives. And the third is trauma. Trauma can really impact ego states. And that's why Bessel van der Kolk um, wrote in The Body Keeps the Score that we need parts work to work with trauma. And I'll explain why as we move along. Okay, the first piece around how ego states form is through normal differentiation. And here I added in some uh, stock images for you and we can start at the bottom right. You might have the experience of having a professional self and you'll see that this person is holding themselves in a way that is confident. They're dressed in a way that's appropriate. Um, you know, they're not wearing necessarily really bright colors perhaps. Um, then if you move to the left, you have a social ego state. Uh, and these look like uh, two people at a conference perhaps or um, at an event who are chatting away. Um, next to that, there is, uh, I put a picture of a protest. Uh, there is no planet B. So think about, you know, as social workers, one of our core values is advocacy. And I don't know if you've had the experience of when advocating, there can be a certain um, anger, perhaps, or a quality of energy that is, um, you know, uh, a rebellious, perhaps, or, you know, you need to harness something within you to say, this isn't right. I put a picture of a military person here. Think about how difficult it must be to act one way in one context and then have to engage another ego state if you're back home, um, as opposed to being in combat. Um, and uh, next to that, there is a person uh, with their arms up in the air, uh, dancing, you know, at a concert. So you, this is a very specific state um, where you can, you know, let yourself go, be with abandon. Um, and then if you look above that, there's an intimate ego state where, you know, we want to be close, we want to touch, we want to let our guard down. Next to that, there is a um, spiritual state. Right? And you can see the way that that person's body is positioned, um, that they're connected to something. And then uh, uh, to the right of it, there is a uh, you know, silly parenting ego state, not to be confused with the ego state that has to set boundaries um, or offer protection. So I hope that this is pretty clear about um, ego states. We all have them and they're really normal. And it's interesting to actually get in touch with what they are for you. If you're an artist, a painter, a writer, a dancer, a parent. Um, another way that ego states develop are through um, what we call an introject. So we become what we are taught. Now, when we are little, uh, you know, kids internalize their caregivers as a way to regulate emotions and behaviors. You know, if a caregiver says, don't do that, that's not allowed. You have to pick up your socks. Be nice to your sister, right? All your life, you're getting these messages. 
Interjects can be positive, negative, or neutral, right? I have an ego state that says, make the bed every morning. And that's pretty neutral, sometimes negative if I can be very rigid with it, right? But we collect everything we've learned and we learn from the people who teach us. Um, what we learn implicitly or explicitly from our caregivers can act as a catalyst for how we see ourselves, worthy or unworthy, the world is safe or unsafe. And as we grow, we have influential figures in our lives that we internalize as well. So this is um, an interesting graphic here. I've asked for permission from um, on the right there, this Instagram artist, um, mom brain therapist. I just thought this was so brilliant um, to consider how your own ego states have developed in the context of your families of origins. How did your families deal with stress? How did they solve problems after, uh, how did they solve relationship ruptures? Was there a process of repair? Um, how do people in your family care for themselves? How do uh, you apologize? How do you approach differences, care for the environment? Um, so these are all things that are not implicit, which goes back to, uh, sorry, they're not explicit, which goes back to that iceberg where a majority of the bulk floats below water. And yet people, you know, it might sound so cliche in therapy where we do an assessment of family, what you've learned consciously and unconsciously. Okay. Um, so trauma is another way that ego states develop. When we go through a traumatic experience, it can create an ego state or a part of self that is stuck in the trauma time. So here we're using the trauma, uh, the word trauma um, in a way that might be different than you've heard it before. So the way that I've learned about trauma is that there's big T trauma, which is incident driven. Uh, it happens in disasters like war, if you lose a loved one, if you're assaulted or have surgery. But we also go through trauma all the time in our society. And if you're familiar with uh, Gabor Mate's work, he really talks and writes a lot about how our society is inherently traumatic, right? Think about the address at the beginning of our uh, time together, just about the roots of our culture and our society. There's so much that we soak in um, unknowingly. And then we wonder, why am I having these symptoms? Why am I engaging in alcohol use or abuse? Or why am I, um, you know, uh, so concerned with my body? It's because we live in a context. Um, so small T trauma can be a breakup, witnessing parental divorce, chronic illness, feeling rejected, experiencing bullying. Um, and in post-traumatic stress, we hold the memory. And then when something triggers that memory, the ego state can come online. And remember, ego state can be what we see, feel, hear, um, sense, the language we use. Um, and again, memory is associative. Going back to that slide of the, you know, banana muffins, the driving. Um, so traumatic experiences are stored in the body as they were experienced at the time. So when we experience a situation that overwhelms us, it gets frozen in our memory. And then when something in the, fu in the future reminds us, it could be the smell of a banana muffin. It pokes and boom, it's an ego state that comes online that might not be time oriented. So sometimes if my clients will literally say, you know, is this still relevant on December 13th, 2021? And do you know that, you know, what happened is over? So all of this is to say that we understand the development of our personality, our psyche as a snowball effect. And um, <laughs> I love this uh, uh, visual of a young person uh, making a snowball. So we are the accumulation of all that we've learned and come to know throughout our lives. I liken this to reading. First, we learn letters. Then we learn how to make sounds. Then we put sounds together to make words. Then we make sense of the words. We read sentences, paragraphs, chapters, and books. So in ego state therapy, we become radically curious about all the parts of ourselves, why they developed, are they still relevant? 
so that we can become aware of the beliefs, feelings, emotions, sensations we are unconsciously holding. Again, we feel less shame around the symptoms. This developed in a context. I'm sure there's a good reason for it. We lessen internal conflict because I'm not ashamed of one of the ways I feel. It doesn't mean I have to act on it. Um, we can lessen external conflict. A lot of, you know, I'm thinking of a quote from a training I was at recently um, about Wendy Lemke. She's a brilliant um, psychologist that teaches about ego state. And she said, when we lessen internal conflict, invariably, we also lessen external conflict. Uh, so oftentimes when people come to couples therapy, uh, there's interventions that can be done individually to help actually the couple relate in a more productive manner. Okay. Um, I'm just noticing I have, I'm just going to check out the chat box. Oh, someone said, can I full screen the slides? Yes, I can, but then I actually can't see the chat. So let me see. Let me see if we can do this. Oh, I can't see the chat box. Thank you. That must have been very annoying to see all my slides. I can appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Um, somebody made a comment. I just want to read. It's so interesting because I was socialized to think that the best optimal state is to have all the parts of yourself really well integrated. But this approach says it's okay to have multiple parts that are different. Sounds like it normalizes compartmentalizing as a legitimate way of coping. Absolutely. I don't think compartmentalizing necessarily in and of itself is a bad thing. Um, you don't want to bring your intimate self to a professional meeting in the same way you don't want to bring a professional meeting to your silly parenting self, right? They just don't mesh. Here's a visual image that I found so useful. Um, so the goal of ego state therapy is to become aware of the states and be able to shift between them smoothly and as needed. So when I gave the pres a presentation for the faculty about uh, emotional regulation, which can be you know, conceptualized as applying the appropriate quality of energy to the situation at hand. So this, comes, uh, this diagram comes from the Watkins research. Um, and if you look at the very left of the continuum, you see that there's A, B, and C with um, permeable lines between them. And let's consider that we all have, you know, perhaps a professional self, um, a social self, and a spiritual self. So when we are in a professional setting, we bring that state forward. When we're spiritual, we're spiritual. When we're social, we bring a different ego state. And if you move to the right of that continuum, you can see how mental health challenges can occur when there isn't a, you know, knowledge of the other parts or integration. Uh, I'll give a perfect example. If you are familiar with borderline uh, personality disorder, uh, that is an attachment disorder um, where there is a part of a person that feels so desperate to be connected to somebody else. And yet there's another part of them that is terrified of connection and pushes that person away. So the presentation might be um, one moment, I really want you close to me. And the other moment is get away. I hate you. Right. So there are there's a lack of integration or working together of ego states. And again, at the very right of the continuum, where you see that um, border between the states as being very, um, you know, impermeable at the most extreme, um, at the most extreme presentation, you might get dissociative identity disorder, where uh, one part doesn't know about uh, the knowledge that another part holds. And again, that's beyond the scope of our time together. But when I learned this, it was as if just a light switch went off in my brain and my understanding of trauma um, just absolutely snowballed, I guess you could say. Um, and here's another um, conceptualization of what happens actually when we move to the other side of the differentiation dissociation continuum. So at the right, you'll see that well-adjusted, um, you know, person who can move between those states, but there are also problems if you can't move those states or there's no boundaries between them. Um, you know, if you go to a work party and somebody is very boisterous, you might think, 
hmm, I don't know if this is the right ego state to bring here. Um, and on the very left of the continuum, there's no sense of other ego states. So um, if there are any, you know, people who identify as a workaholic, right, all I know how to do is be this self. And then when I go to a social situation, I'm lost. This is an ego state that's underdeveloped. Okay. All righty. How do we access ego states? So we might ask, uh, is there any part of you that can help with this? We might just ask directly. Okay, even just conceptualizing people and problems in this way can be useful. Um, you know, I'm hearing you say this one thing and I'm wondering, you know, is there any other part that can provide some feedback? And I'm always amazed at my client's internal wisdom to be able to respond. If you ask people, they will tell you. Another way is through drawing or journaling. So I recommend right when you're feeling good, right when you're struggling, become curious about the language used. Um, I don't know if you've ever read something you've written and said, uh, wow, did I really write that? Or, you know, sometimes um, you'll notice that your writing is actually different. I know uh, my progress notes with clients sometimes uh, look a little bit more, you know, clean and put together if I'm, if I'm feeling really resourced or if I'm going really fast, um, that gives me a window into, hmm, what ego state is online right now? And another way we can access ego states is through hypnosis. So um, I spent the whole weekend actually with the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis um, learning to bring people into a trance where we say, okay, can your unconscious mind come forward? Um, and it was just an amazing and transformative experience to add clinical hypnosis to a toolbox that can help us tap into this unconscious mind. Do we have any questions about the theory perhaps at all? Um, is anyone, you know, completely uh, flabbergasted or lost or um, they have something that they're, you know, really wanting to know before we move on to practical applications. And I like this picture, like, what do we do with all this information? And how can I feel better? That's why I'm here, right? To learn about how we can apply this. So pop into the chat if you want to share anything. Otherwise, okay. Ego state therapy applications that are relevant to December, 2021. So yeah, someone said, thank you for discussing the difference between big T and little t trauma. Absolutely. I'm so happy that that's a useful conceptualization. Okay. So common themes I hear in my practice that make me think of ego state therapy are why can family gatherings be so stressful and why am I more depressed in the winter? So we're going to talk about family gatherings. <clears throat> so uh, family gatherings occur within the context of expectations of what we hope might happen versus what many people's realities look like. So the holidays can often bring this perfectionist ego state online. Um, and I have this, you know, graphic here of these like, you know, cute little kids putting up uh, you know, ornaments on a tree. And yet, what does it actually look like in reality? So in our culture, we have this idea, this notion of what is the perfect family? What does it look like? Who will be there? How close are you to parents and siblings? What if you're not actually in touch with them? Or what if that relationship is hard? On a conscious level, you know that having an imperfect relationship with your family doesn't say anything about you, but you might have this perfectionist part that develops within the context of our society. Uh, so remember, ego states are like a snowball. They connect because of the movies we see. We live in a context of social media. So if uh, you know this can be triggered by um, social media, movies, social expectations, um, you know, the idea if it's the most wonderful time of the year, is it? For some people, it's not. And I think we have to normalize that. Or it can be wonderful and taxing. It can be many things at once. From an ego state perspective, I want to, I might ask a client, for example, I want to ask all the parts of you 
how do you view this holiday dinner? Um, or perhaps that it's not what you hoped it would be. Can we become aware of all the parts of you with no judgment at all? So we might draw, you know, I have my whiteboard here. I might draw that projector screen, a situation to examine. And we might say all the seats at the theater. How are you feeling? Or what are your thoughts about this? Oh, isn't that interesting? There's some conflicting views. I'm really excited to be with my family. And I do find that it's tiring because, you know, um, I have to come and, you know, bring food or um, engage. Um, so there can be many mixed feelings. Can we become aware of all the parts of you with no judgment? Once we become aware of the parts, we can ask another part perhaps to help. Um, we can consider if it's too painful to, dis to visit with uh, disappointments or if there's a phobia of exploring uh, what happens for me when I think of the holidays or family. This can often lead to mental health symptoms um, because these parts are operating in the background anyways. It's like we consider on an iPhone when there are many apps in the background or um, on a browser, if you've had the experience of many tabs open on the browser. Um, Ego State Therapy simply says, what are those tabs? Can we be curious? Do you like some tabs more than the other? Are you embarrassed about any of them? Okay, can we be with that? Many people feel shame about the ways that they think and feel, and there's a phobia about exploring. So that when we have a phobia of things, that's when we get um, these more strict um, barriers between the ego states, which can, you know, uh, be protective at times um, and uh, can be, you know, can, can be challenging. So family gatherings can trigger specific ego states. So if we recall that ego states come online when they're triggered, we can consider there are a lot of potential triggers in our families. They can be obvious, like a family member who makes inappropriate jokes. If there are substances, some family member, members might become inebriated and loud, or you know, um, they can present in a way that feels distressing for you. There's also um, a family member who has passed, you know, the absence is especially felt around the holidays. Um, so these are, you know, obvious ones, but it can also be more subtle. Remember that memories are stored as not only images, but also emotions, sensations, and five sense perceptions. So you might have the experience of uh, so many clients I talk to say, you know, I hear the voice of a family member and I just... I lose it. I don't know what happens. I just get transported to a different part of me. Isn't that interesting that your family member's voice does that? Uh, the way that a house or an apartment smells is so connected to memory. So if you are feeling triggered, um, I'm sure there is a very good reason for that. And in therapy, we get so curious about what that might be. Um, and again, Okay, so I have a question, uh, a few questions, actually. Thank you so much for your participation. Someone said, does ego state therapy align with gestalt patterns? And I would answer, I'm not sure. I haven't studied gestalt, um, but I'm curious if anyone else on the call uh, can provide some feedback. And I have another question. Can you say more about asking a part of you to help you with this? Can you give an example? Yes, I can. We're actually about to move on to that part in our time together. Okay, I'll skip this. Um, so there are exercises to strengthen ego states that can help if you're struggling this holiday season. And it's not just about talk therapy. Um, it's about feeling what it's like to connect to these states. And I put a picture here of a person weightlifting. So we can actually strengthen ego states by practicing visiting with them. In the same way that, um, you know, there's this brilliant quote of... Um, a teacher that I studied with that said, uh, in the same way that we have triggers to trauma, we can have keys to comfort. So we can practice what are the things that make you feel comforted and bring ego states online that can help us. Um, and we have this amazing, uh, you know, principle of malleability in the brain that neuronal con connections, um, they are created with repetition. So um, I'll give you some examples. 
we can build the strength of ego states that can help us. Um, and we have to practice. We have to practice feeling them, being with them, learning their language. Um, so it's not about the parts of you that are struggling, going away or getting lost. Um, think about in a family system. What if there's someone you just don't really like and you say, get out of here. You're so annoying. Ugh, I can't believe you're here again. That would create a conflict within the family system. We do the same thing with our internal family system where we would say, um, you don't say, I like this piano key more than this one. It's in the actual um, you know, integration of everything together that we get um, positive mental health. So it's about who can help. And here are a few ego states that I use consistently in my work. I use the adult ego, ego state, nurturing, protective, wise, and connected. And the wonderful thing about the flexibility of ego state therapy is that you can find your own ego states that are helpful. So uh, we utilize in ego state therapy, you know, what's, uh, what's useful for you if there are, um, you know, uh, I had a session where a client taught me all about jujitsu. I had no idea what jujitsu was, but they have a part of themselves that is so um, developed around that, that we connected to that and used, um, you know, that form, uh, uh, that ego state to solve a work problem. Isn't that interesting? So let's practice. Oh, actually, no, we're not going to practice adult ego state, but I'll tell you about it. Um, so an adult ego state um, is, I know there's a lot of text here, you can read this on your own time. Um, I'm just going to share, you know, what I find helpful. Um, oftentimes, we can uh, build our adult ego states, like we might on the right, uh, spend time with these mantras of, as an adult, I'm only responsible for my own thoughts, feelings and actions. Um, I'm not responsible for the thoughts, feelings and actions of other people. Um, I'm good enough or lovable. I can choose who to trust. I can keep myself safe. I can make my own choices. I don't have to stay somewhere. I don't feel comfortable. It's okay to not meet people's expectations if it means taking care of myself. I can rest if I feel sad. Um, so a tip to bring the adult self online. So with some clients, what we'll do is I'll say, um, you know, grab your college or university degree, right? Like you uh, have to have an immense amount of skill to do that. Let's talk about it. Can you have a visual reminder? Remember, ego states are triggered by something. Um, I'll show you in my workspace. I always have a hand cream that I use um, during sessions when I need to remind myself my nurturing ego state. Okay, um, I'm going to take some time to care for myself. Um, so an adult ego state can be especially useful if um, someone has gone through a traumatic experience and there's an ego state that feels really young. We might say, can you take care of that young ego state? What does that ego state want from you? Okay, does it want you to hold it? Just notice that so you can use imagery and imagination. We all need a nurturing, or maybe I should say, I am curious if we all need a nurturing ego state. Um, I practice from an attachment perspective, which says uh, nurturing is not the cherry on top of development. It's a core uh, developmental facet of what we need to develop um, in a healthy way. So we are actually going to practice um, bringing our nurturing ego state online. Um, so I want you even just to take a look at this picture. And I want you to notice, are there any thoughts or feelings that come online? Just have a look. You can pop in the chat to let me know. And you can take some time to consider, but we're going to work uh, with a meditation now to uh, see if we can tap in to this nurturing ego state within you. So if you're struggling with something uh, in, the, in the holiday season, you know, you might uh, see if you can tap into this state. So when you're ready, I invite you to find yourself in a comfortable position. 
So that might mean your feet are flat on the floor and your palms are in your lap. If you wish to close your eyes, I invite you to do that, or you can keep your gaze gently down. And simply start here by noticing your breath. That's it. And as you notice your breath, you might find your jaw relaxing, your shoulders softening, your stomach releasing. Know that you can go as deep or light into this experience as you wish to. And if it feels safe and manageable, perhaps you let go just a little bit more. And isn't it reassuring to know that perhaps you can access this state pretty efficiently. Here we are. And I want you to imagine in your own mind a nurturing person in your life or a nurturing place or a nurturing activity Something that when you think about it, perhaps has you feeling like you're right there, getting more and more nurtured. And as you experience this nurturing, you let go just a little bit more. And in your mind, you can visit with any images that come to mind. And if you wish, you can now pause at one image that feels especially comfortable or nurturing for you. Notice what you see, the colors, the textures, the sounds. Notice the emotions in the body and the sensations. And I want you to narrow your focus here. If there is a color in your experience, can you become curious about the shade, the way it interacts with light? And notice how nurtured and comfortable it might feel to be with this color. Knowing that when you see this color in the future, you will have this experience of nurturing when you need it. And isn't it reassuring to know that you know how to nurture yourself? or receive nurturing. Slowly, I invite you to join me back to our time together. Won't it be curious to see what wants to move first, your feet or your hands? Which finger or toe wants to move first? And then I invite you to find any movement that feels supportive, a yawn or a stretch. And I'm so curious to know what people's experiences were 
did anyone have a scene in particular that they uh, imagined? And did people see a color? Or did people experience not too much of anything? If you'd like to share, please pop into the chat. So this is one of the ways that we can grow uh, ego states by, uh, you know, that was a very uh, meditative experience. Um, and I do a lot of meditation with my clients because we have to have that felt sense of something. It's one thing to talk, talk, talk. It's another thing to experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so somebody popped into the chat and said they thought about sunrises and sunsets. I love the pink hues. They seem so warm and protective to my worried self. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, so we can draw on, you know, see what I did with color. It's associative. So now when you see a pink hue, perhaps, or a sunrise sunset, you might connect that to nurturing. And of course, really solidifying this within a short amount of time we have together um, might be challenging, but I want you to get a sense of what do you need to strengthen and how can you do that? We all need a protective ego state. So this is different um, than nurturing, right? Think about that, uh, you know, advocacy state that is, you know, um, assertive, uh, that might have the body positioned in a different way. So I added in some, um, some suggestions on the right, uh, if you want some inspiration for a protective ego state. But, you know, I love talking to some clients and I say, I'm so happy that your protective ego state has come to visit us today. Um, when people tell me about setting boundaries with other people, it's, it's so wonderful um, that your protective ego state has uh, made an appearance and is protecting you. And people get so creative with this. Uh, it's, it's a really fun way of conceptualizing as well. I'm drawing on, you know, the lady dragon from Shrek as my protective ego state. And she comes and she helps me when I need to say no to someone who's pushing my boundaries. And then we all need a wise ego state. Um, you know, certainly there is, uh, you know, a rebellious teenager part of me and there's this wise ego state part of me. Um, and I tap into this wise ego state part um, through uh, yoga practice and meditation. So I, I wanted to give you um, a gift of, you know, conceptualizing the changes in seasons. So, uh, you know, how do we feel better this winter? One of the things that I find really helpful is this notion, this felt sense of the winter will pass, right? So that we'll do this, you know, in a, oh, we've got a little bit of time left, but just enough time, I feel, to uh, engage in this activity. So you can find yourself again in a comfy seat. You can close your eyes if you'd like or keep them open. Isn't it comforting to know you know exactly what it is that you specifically need? And find your breath here. Notice it coming in and out all on its own. Soften your face and your jaw. Relax your brain, so it doesn't have to work hard here. And I want you now to focus on the inhale. And every time your unique inhale comes, I want you to imagine the felt sense of spring. So as you breathe in, you might have the sense of filling up blooming, regenerating, just like that. And now, as you continue to breathe in your own comfortable breath pattern, I want you to imagine that the pause at the top of the inhale is summer. You might choose to linger there when your own breath leads you to the top of the inhale. Notice what it's like to feel full.
to come to fruition, to actualize. Keep breathing with your own breath pattern. Now I'd like you to bring aware, your awareness to the exhale as it comes to you. And I want you to imagine that the exhale represents the leaves on the trees letting go. A sense of that change in season. And then I want you now to shift awareness to the space at the bottom of the exhale on empty. You'll linger just for a moment. And every time you return to the bottom of the exhale, you'll linger in that place that represents winter. Stillness, a pause, emptiness. And then I want you now to imagine that four part breath cycle representing this change in season, this cycle that comes every year. Good. And when you're ready, you'll slowly start to rejoin our time together. You'll find movement in your fingers and toes. You'll yawn or you'll stretch. And I'm curious to know, what was that like for you? If anyone would like to share, please pop into the chat. Oh, and then the last piece to end off our time together, I just noticed that we're at eight o'clock is the invisible string. So we all need a connected ego state. So, you know, we're always together, even when we're not. People who love each other are always connected through a special string made of love. So if you go on YouTube, you can listen to the story, the invisible string uh, read to you, which is a beautiful way to conceptualize that we have an ego state that knows that we're never alone, that we're always connected to other people. That's it. So... If you have any uh, questions or comments, um, I'm so you know curious to know um, what you think. Uh, if you have you know any feedback, I would love to hear. Yeah. Thank you so much for the feedback. So I've added again, my email um, into, I'll add it into the text box here. Info at jensophieshields.com. Yeah, so, you know, oh, I sent it to uh, just one person. So yeah, I'll send my email here. Um, and if you have any questions about where I got this information, if you want further training, um, please feel free to, uh, to reach out. Let me take the opportunity to thank you, Jen. Thank you on behalf of the Alumni Association and the 80 plus people who joined us tonight, somewhere on and off, but thank you so much. As usual, you brought insight, you brought knowledge, you brought skills, you brought relaxation, and we all experienced it and we're all there. Thank you so much.